creating a culture of love. To pull something from your imagination and to have the audacity to put it into the real world, fear is a profitable emotion. And the thing with trying, you're doing. Whenever you're trying, you're actually doing it. Right? Like, let's remember that. But that other thing, right? In, in this world where we want to be everywhere, we want to be seen, we want to be in it. I asked him, like, how do I succeed here? And he was like, look, I can accept you failing, but I can't accept you not trying. He said, I need you to try. Like, your whole life you've tried. And look at where it led you. Keep that energy. Keep trying. Don't worry about outcomes. And I'm like, bet. You hit that from Mike. That's like, I'm shooting from the parking lot, bro. As soon as I get the ball, as <laughs> soon as you give me the ball, I'm pulling up. Jason Maiden. What up, dude? Thank you so much for coming in and blessing the studio. Again, your energy, your vibe, everything's all about, it's just spot on to what we need in this world. And when we can start gravitating to people that are magnetic in the same space, I think it's our duty yeah. to keep cultivating that and work in and, and bug and outreach and follow through and mm -hmm. make sure both sides of it are, are leading on that. So thank you so much. It's been amazing. We just met and like we're already there. But uh, creativity is a sport. Yeah. Uh, as an athlete, that right there is like we forget how much life is sport. And also the intersection of, you know, you go to a favela in Colombia, you see the kids playing football, soccer, and you see all the graffiti around. And you see the unity between, ah, this kid's playing ball, then he's going to go mm -hmm. tag up the wall. Or the tagger's watching the kid play ball. Or vice versa and all that. And this is how we get people out of getting in trouble, right? Yeah. And using energy for other things, to be productive, to create things in the world. So I just love that concept. And let's just dive into that. What is the yeah. sport of creativity? Yeah, I think um, for me, the sport of creativity is the pursuit of humanity's boldest endeavors. Because it's like to... To pull something from your imagination and to have the audacity to put it into the real world repeatedly. Like, it takes a certain amount of youthfulness. It takes a certain amount of resilience. It takes a certain amount of self-determination because you constantly have to fight against your insecurities in order mm -hmm. to keep producing. Because your greatest enemy in the sport of creativity is your enemy. It's your inner dialogue. Yeah. Oh, this ain't good enough. Nobody's going to like it. Nobody's going to feel it. Self-doubt. Right? Like you can't go back and watch game footage being a creative. I mm -hmm. can't improve my technique unless I continue to practice. Um, and practicing in a creative sport means I have to put it up for critique. I have to put it into the world. It's different when you, you know, when you hoop in a running track or in a weight room, right? Like you can see instant results. You feel it when mm -hmm. you when you bench press, you reach your PR, you kind of push. But when you put creative things into the world, the satisfaction isn't immediate. You know, because you start to look at all the things you wish you could have done better. Oh, yeah. It's like, oh, right I see that. Oh, they're going to find out. So for me, I call creativity a sport because it's not a perishable skill. Um, athleticism is, but curiosity isn't. Mm. And if we view curiosity as, you know, this beautiful expression of potential, then we'll put a different value on the youth and a value on our elders. Mm -hmm. Right? We wouldn't necessarily always look to people in the middle and be like, they're the ones leading culture. Like, no, we would value the 80 year old guy who still makes these beautiful handmade ceramics in Peru or yeah. this 10 year old kid who's, you know, doing watercolors. Like we would value them more um, if we saw curiosity as, as, as a athletic skill set. Mm -hmm. And I know once I had my kid, he's two and a half now, there is something that like, I'm a curious person, yeah. but that was like a steroid injection to like, whoa, Cause he looks a piece of trash. It's like glorious. It yeah. makes noise. Yeah. It, it it reflects light. Yeah. It, I could bend it into things. He doesn't know it's trash. We know it's trash, and then we devalue it. But like, what could we turn that into? So, being eternally curious is this yeah. this new quest of, you know, you hear a lot of people. Like, I'm bored. I'm bored. Yeah. I'm like, are you bored? Is life boring? Or, or are you a boring person? Or where's your curiosity? Where's your zest for life? That's it. It, How man. do we keep that going? Yeah, it's the paradox of choice and privilege, right? Like, as a society, specifically North America, we've done two things that have killed our ability to access creativity for the rest of our lives. One um, is the cheer back, this thing. 
Like the reason I say that is if you go to other cultures that have longer life expectancies, better community infrastructure, just overall sense of well-being, they don't have cheer backs. They sit in deep squats mm. or they stand or they walk. So the fact that we've given ourselves this immediate, you know, safety net of being able to sit it's almost as if we've lost that hunt together a spirit to go out and discover because it's innate to humans to have to preserve our well-being and to yeah. go out and you know harvest our food and find our food and try not here we sit we press a button so first thing is just the, the convenience of how this changed our relationship with effort yeah. the cheer back and like it's crazy when you look at posture and how it affects health and everything second thing is our school system has rewarded mastery over discovery and so you go to school and you're pretty much encouraged to remember other people's facts. Yep. And there's no such thing as the truth. It's just a predetermined set of things you pick from in multiple choice and you figure out which one is the one that's going to be the right Memorize, answer. Memorize, regurgitate. That's it. And so it's wild when you look at curiosity. I think NASA did the study where they said the age of four is the peak of imagination and it drastically declines. That also strangely correlates to when we enter in the edu education system here. Because um, I found when I travel to other countries, because they don't have, you know, an abundance of choice or an overwhelming amount of distractions, the greatest form of software that they use is their imagination. Mm. So they're freer and they're more open to like, you know, um, thematic play, which is essentially make believe. You know, and we, I mean, I see it all over the world. Or you see it in, even in the U.S. in parts of the country where they don't have a lot of resources. Like kids, you're this person, you're that person, they all make believe. Mm -hmm. But we demonize that as like a lowbrow activity or something that's like, oh, man, that's cute. It's yeah. like, nah, man, this is this is the most important developmental, I would say, milestone in anyone's life is the ability to imagine. Because mm -hmm. that helps us change our reality because reality isn't fixed. We can always alter it. But when we have a generation of people that believe reality is fixed, we also have just brought about the subjugation of an entire population because people don't know that they have different choices. So they don't make any choices. I know. is not that, that right there. So you have these conversations, right? And people are like, well, I didn't have a choice. I'm like, did you? Or you didn't see it or you weren't conditioned to look for other choices yeah. or we just don't make the choice. So guess what? Someone's making it for you. So you're yeah. in these two, yeah. that, that's just a, a, a an issue of like, I'm not choosing, so it's made for me, or I can't see a choice. Yeah. You know, it's like this weird, vicious circle, and we're getting lazier and lazier, I think, more fear-driven, more yeah. fear-based. Yeah. Tell me what to think, and I'm going to regurgitate it. Yeah. Like, it's not just in creativity. I think it's happening in Everywhere. how we dialogue, how we interact, just social constructs, what we eat, what we, it's in everything. Yeah. Yeah. Fear is a profitable emotion. You know, it's a profitable emotion because people double down with extreme emotions. Like you look at sport, right? If I love my team, I love Chicago, everything about it. I hate the White Sox. I mean, excuse me, I hate the Cubs. Love the White Sox. I'm a South Sider through and through. Yeah. I will argue with anyone, even if I know I'm wrong, because I love the White Sox. Now, if you were to say, all right, that's a nuanced perspective. What happens with the mass psychosis that can control the entire population? It's outrage. So if everyone's outraged and then the algorithm in our phone is reinforcing our own beliefs and bias, there's no way for us to even consent to what a shared reality is because my reality is based on my algorithm. Mm -hmm. Your reality is based on yours. So we're both outraged, but for different reasons. Mm -hmm. And we start to look at each other and we never communicate about what the real issue is. Yeah. Right. Like you, in sport, when you're debating your team, you get facts and stats and why. But think about other parts of our life where there's friction. We don't we don't even give any information. It's no. opinion masquerading as fact. Yeah. And that's what they've done, man. And it, it's not accidental. It's very intentional. Um, and we do have a chance and a choice to continue to engage with it or create a completely different system. Imagine if we looked at politics that way. Man, bro. It, <laughs> don't get me started. I, I know, yeah, we, we're not going to go down that <laughs> rabbit hole. But this is true. That, and this Again, all these things that we can talk about and around creativity and also let's add the other thing of people who just say, well, I'm not creative. Yeah. Like, That's bullshit. How yeah. you dress yourself, how you make your eggs in the morning, like how you brush your teeth. It sounds, you know, like a throwaway activity, but yeah. if you really think about it, oh, I do it this way or I do that or I put bell peppers and I chop them up and I like how 
you put it together. That recipe was creativity. Yeah. Yeah. The, the outfit you're putting together is your creativity, your style coming through. So I think yeah. when we dumb down and say we're not creative, when, when do we lose that? About four years old. So there's two, there's two groupings of, of what they call cognitive blocking. Um, so a kid has a tremendous amount of plasticity. They can absorb a ton of information. They may not be able to articulate or theorize exactly how to apply the info, but they store it away. Mm -hmm. So four through seven, height of creativity. Eight years old is the beginning of your adult personality. So if you believe you're not creative, you're slow, you're ugly, you're fat, you're under, whatever it is you believe, the seeds are planted. You get to middle school, those seeds are watered because those beliefs are reinforced. Everything becomes confirmation bias. Like, oh, they don't like me because I'm X. They don't like me. And that scales into the rest of adulthood. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I recently was explaining during a Bible study, like, I've been doing a real deep examination over the purpose of work and what work really is. And what it led me to understand was how we've created this classification of people based on this misnomer with the word talent. So talent in antiquity was used to measure like gold, right? It was a unit of measurement for a monetary kind of currency or reserve. Mm -hmm. Once we started saying talent is something you're either born with or not born with, it's an innate characteristic. We saw this frisure in society where people say, I don't have no talent or I'm really talented. I'm not creative or I'm really creative. That works well in a capitalistic society because when a person that doesn't have a trained eye sees someone, they believe they're talented. They're not realizing that that's just interest sustained in the direction for a long period of time. That's mm. discipline. Discipline actually looks like talent to yeah. untrained eye. So in a capitalistic society, when you think that you can't achieve something, it's because we're told we don't have the talent to achieve. No, you don't have the discipline. Because if everybody had discipline, a lot of our goals will become within our reach. A lot of excuses will go away. And we'll also start questioning these people who've told us that these are our choices. We can create a lane instead of joining one. And so it all comes down to that little word and how they've reframed it. Because we're invaluable as people. You can't place a value in a human life. No. But the market does. Yeah. They'll tell you your worth. But it's like, does it have to be that way? Why is it that way? Do we need to keep going that direction? Is it healthy? I don't believe it is. Um, I'm not anti-capitalism. I'm just for, you know, being honest about what is the downside of it. Mm-hmm. And the downside is this thing where 95% of the population just says, I'm not creative. So we probably have cures to diseases that'll never be found. Yeah. You know, beautiful poetry that'll never be written, films that'll never be made because people just decided that they're not enough. Damn. Right? It's wild, bro. It's hella wild. You know what's funny? We are born enough. Born enough. We are born enough. If you look at it from where you come from, from all the things... You are born enough, and you also, this is all we have. And then we get to wrestle with, are we worthy of all the things that we get to have? So, okay, we're born enough, we're born worthy, and then we start choosing that we're not enough and we're not worthy. And then we add that third layer of belonging. Do I belong? And, you know, as a brown kid growing up, there's one combo. As a black kid growing up, as an Asian kid, as a white kid, there's all different levels of belonging. Then yeah. there's... Athletic, non-athletic. Then there's creative, not creative. Like we start adding all these layers. Yeah. So now only do we not think we're enough. We don't think we're worthy. And then we don't belong. Yeah. So we're the weirdos in the corner. Luckily, the weirdos in the corner are getting bigger. Yeah, yeah. The corner's getting smaller <laughs> but, too. So. Uh, but that's wild how that just starts stacking up. It does, man. And it's, 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 it's crazy because it stacks up. We've been tricked to believe, you know, we own stuff, right? We're stewards of everything. We really don't own anything because um, there's nothing that's going to be permanent mm. except for how you make people feel and what you leave behind. And you mm. don't really own that either. It's like you can, in, you can inspire it, but, you know, we just, we just have a really weird relationship with the temporal nature of life. Mm. Like we, we, when I hear people, and it's sad too, because the, the age has gotten younger as a result of the pandemic. You know, kids saw their parents frustrated and kids thought it's their fault. We don't know how that's going to grow into mm -hmm. adulthood with the subconscious seed being planted that my parents' frustration was a result of me. Because a child seeing their parent on Zoom. Cause and effect. Cause and effect. They don't realize that the parents frustrated at work, not them. They yeah. just absorb it. And so that's why you're seeing the the age, average age of suicide drastically dropped to like 11 or 12. Yeah, that's wild. Wild, that's, That is like unreal. Heartbreaking. Even and then, lived yet. Ain't even lived. 
But what's also wild, bro, is I found this out this week that one of the fastest growing demographics of people who have either attempted suicide or successfully, you know, went through with the act are pastors. Pastors. That's interesting. It, it blew my mind. And then I started to really think about the faith community. And I'm like, it makes so much sense when I'm thinking about my flock, the people that have been entrusted to me. And mm -hmm. I'm seeing the families lose their, their houses or can't eat. And I can't do anything about it, but offer them prayer. Mm -hmm. Or I see the kids suffering and walking away from their faith. I can't do anything but offer prayer. So now the pastors are internalizing the emotions of like not being able to serve the congregation that's been entrusted to them. Mm -hmm. So we're in this vicious cycle of people being told they're not enough. That's the greatest trick of the enemy. And we got to break out of that. And let me add one to the religious concept, right? Because whatever religion you subscribe to, whatever book you read yeah. to, they all say the same, same thing. things. Yeah. But they all tell us what to do. They don't actually tell us how to be. Mm -mm. Right? What's out there teaching us how to be? Be love, right? Like, go love your neighbor. Okay, yeah. but I don't love myself. Well, how do I be love? How do I do self-love? How do I do that? Go forgive someone. How do I forgive myself? Yeah. Like, they, so we know what to do, but we're having this constant battle of like, well, I don't know how to be it. I could put on the face and do it for you. But like, yeah, that's why I could see that. that. Yeah, because I mean, people can only become what they see. Mm -hmm. And we don't see the, the archetype of a kind, empathic leader that's been successful and doesn't expect reciprocity is to a lot of people just a myth. Like they, they don't think that person exists. Mm -hmm. I strive to be that person because I didn't have that person. And I know how important it is for somebody to still know that there's goodness in the world and kindness in the world. So I try to position myself to be viewed as an uncommon man. I don't, I don't want to be like a lot of people in my industry. And so folks have just given up and people now assume kindness as an angle. Like I think when we met, we talked about it. Like I, I, I've had to tell several people, I'm a circle. I'm not a square. I don't have angles, bro. Like mm -hmm. if you sit at my table, we, we all eat. I don't want a little bro, a little sis, anybody. Like, I, I live my childhood dream. I don't need to prove nothing to nobody. Yeah. I'm good. For the rest of my life, I'm good. I can say I did it. How do we make that contagious? Man, bro, like, <laughs> it, I think it really comes down to, when I saw Beyond the Veil of Reality as a kid, when I almost passed away, I realized that this ain't about me. This ain't about me. None of this is about me. Not an ounce of my life is for me. Not My, my suffering is not for me. My victories aren't for me. My success isn't for me. My confusion isn't for me. It's for me to have eyes to see and ears to hear so I can spot what's going on in other people and serve mm. them better. So I don't see my suffering as this internal selfish act or things I've been through of like, oh, woe is me. I'm like, nah, next time that I see a person that's going through it, I'm better prepared to be there for them. And that's how I view it. And I don't, I don't think we've been taught of the benefit of struggle. We often hear the downside of it, how difficult it is. Yeah. But struggle is a gift. It's a blessing. And you know this, man, as an athlete, you don't grow unless you put your muscles under atrophy, yeah. <laughs> under controlled struggle. Mm -hmm. It's just when struggle feels out of control that we get scared. But it all is heading in the right direction, like regardless of where people's mm -hmm. lives are at. As long as you're taking a step each day, like mm -hmm. you're going to get to your destination. It may just not look like what you hoped it looked like. Yeah. The people will get there. So that's that's the thing I'm trying to make contagious is, is resilience, you know, over brilliance. It's a lot of... A lot of brilliant idiots. It's a lot of successful, of miserable shirt. people. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Like, I just want people to be more resilient, you know? To, to, because resi resilience leads the long game. But let's talk about that struggle, right? I say the beauty comes within the struggle. Yeah. Trust the journey. Trust the process. Let's go back a little bit into your story. You know, when we first met, you were telling me this story about you. Because the first they connected us because... I have a dream to do a Jordan collab yeah, one yeah. day. Like, that's the dream. And the homie's like, yo, yo, you need to meet. He worked there, yada, yada, yada. But, you know, and you, you kind of dove in. You're like, you know, I was there at Nike. There's something that kind of went dirty. But then Mike stepped up. Nike stepped up. They put me in school. Yeah. So Michael Jordan is a hero to many people, yeah. right? And he's an example of someone that grew up, you know, in Chicago, in the hood, from nothing, became something, put on a pedestal. Yeah. What are the lessons that you learned from that? Please share that story because I think yeah. it's beautiful, but the side that people don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's um, it's interesting because because Mike or Cat, you know, his nickname is Black Cat. The way he navigated the world as an athlete paled in comparison to him as a business person. Mm -hmm. 
and being a fan of him as a child growing up in the shy and then working for him and with him, it gave me like the broadest cross section of understanding of who he really is. Extremely analytical, extremely loyal, um, very driven to win, has it like a winning mentality. Like he wants to win. And he's not like a win at all cost type dude. Like, cause people say that phrase and I always tell them the cost is always people. That's way too much, that's way too high of a price to pay. Yeah. Like, you can win without having to screw people over. That's the point of competition. Yeah. It's a real meritocracy. Mike exemplified the prototypical meritocratic like person. He wanted to compete with you on your best day. No mm. excuses. So when I win, ain't no excuse that I beat you. Mm -hmm. And that that energy for me, especially as a kid, like who felt different. Like I have autism. I was sick. I'm you know multiracial. It's so much going on. I never felt like who I was fit in anywhere. So I created my own alternate universe that I lived in, and Michael was a part of that. And I wanted to be Dr. Lucius Fox to his Bruce Wayne. Like yeah. I can create his gadgets. I can I can help amplify his potential. And it wasn't even about me. It was like my gifts and talents can make that man more mm -hmm. super. Like that's cool to me. Um, and I kept that spirit and working with him, the things that I learned, there were two lessons that I still to this day changed my life. The first one from Mr. Jordan, I'm an intern. And it's wild because it's like first day on the campus, they give you this map and you do orientation and they tell you to go sit at your desk. At least that's how it was when I was an intern in 2001. So very early before design was even a real powerhouse at the company. Mm -hmm. Design reported into merchandising, I think, at that point. We didn't have a C-suite executive. Yeah. So we didn't really have a lot of like strong representation. Um, they give me the map. I go to the Jordan building. I'm thinking Jordan brands in the Jordan building. Makes total sense to yeah. me. It's like same person, dude's faces on the outside. Yeah. Um, nope, this man was in the Jerry Rice building. Jordan Brand was on the fourth <laughs> floor of the Jerry Rice building in the back corner, like the furthest part of campus at that point. Wow. And it was just like a science project. And so I went to the wrong place. They told me where to go. I come up on the elevator. And this was all divine time. And this is how I knew like I was exactly where I was supposed to be. And that my journey was the right one. And I didn't, I, I stopped questioning my life. Mm -hmm. Elevator doors open. I looked down. Mr. Knight spoke at the orientation and he told us about the culture of Nike. No one wears brown shoes. No one wears dress shoes. It's just not us. We're a sneaker and t-shirt company. Yeah. So I'm like, bet, this is great. I could dress the way I want to dress. Door opens up. There are two pairs of really nice handmade Baluti Italian dress shoes. And I'm like, who in the hell is going <laughs> against the culture of the brand? Mr. And I look up, there's Michael Jordan. And there's Larry Miller, the president of Jordan Brand. And mind you, this was the first time I've ever seen him in person in my life. Mm. Like, I saw him once before. We got free tickets from the YMCA that were in the nosebleed seats. Because, you know, inner city kids, you go to the library, they give you free tickets. And you do good in school or you finish your books and you get something from the library. Yeah. Uh, but he was like this little blip. I, I, I never physically seen him. I get mad nervous. I try to close the elevator door, but I pressed the wrong button. It was the one You're that actually like, opened it. Yeah. Is that really? Oh. I'm like, oh, no, nah, dog. Dude, I'm on the wrong floor. This yeah. is crazy. Door's doing this. And then he sticks his hands through the door. And he has these, like, insanely long fingers. Yeah. He's like, you the intern. He touched my chest. It's like my credit score went up. Like, jump shot got better. Like, it was crazy because he knew my name. And he had asked me this question of, like, you know, where did, how did you get here? Mm -hmm. So on my little 19 year old mind, I'm like, oh, I took the elevator. He's like, no, nah, bro. Like literally you came from Roseland, you came from the South side. Like my nephews live in that neighborhood. Now this is where it gets weird. My mom was on a swim team with his ex-wife in high school. I had Ooh. played with his nephews as a kid, never yeah. knew who they were because we were in the same neighborhood, but no actual physical relationship beyond like, oh yeah, you see these kids and you guys move around. Um, and now I look at my mom's yearbook and I'm like, that's Juanita. She's like, yeah, we were on a swim team together. I'm like, this is crazy. So all that flashes through my mind. Mm -hmm. And the advice he gave me, and then I'll tell you the second piece of advice was, I asked him, like, how do I succeed here? And he was like, look, I can accept you failing, but I can't accept you not trying. Because mm. I need you to try. Like, your whole life you've tried. And look at where it led you. Keep that energy. Keep trying. Don't worry about outcomes. And I'm like, bet. You hit that from Mike. That's like, I'm shooting from the parking lot, bro. As soon as yeah. I get the ball, as <laughs> soon as you give me the ball, go. I'm pulling up. Um, the second thing I learned was with Derek Jeter and it was interesting cause I was nervous cause I'm like, man, he's the cool guy. He's suave. Like I'm a nerd, bro. Like I'm, I'm in the club looking at Redfin <laughs> and Zillow. I'm <laughs> yeah. not, you know what I'm saying? I'm like reading white papers at the club trying to figure out science and stuff. Yeah. Um, 
And I'm thinking, man, you know, he's so cool. He's the captain of the Yankees. Like, what will we have in common? Um, come to find out we have a lot in common. And one night when we went out, I didn't realize this at the time, how important it was, but we went to a club, he made his appearance, we go out the back door, we get in the car, no drinking, no party or nothing, just all kind of smoke and mirrors. Hey, it's Jeter's in the building. And my man looked at me and was like, yo, you want to be present enough to be welcome, but absent enough to be missed. Don't be everywhere people expect you to be. Like, you don't have, none of this is real. Don't Ooh. get caught up in this. None of this is real. Say that again. He said, you have to be present enough to be welcome, but absent enough to be missed. And that sticks with me heavy. Cause I'm like, this man, television will tell you, he got all the women he partying. Nope. We had the career plan, Miss Pac-Man, talking about life and finances and like what it's like to be him and how does he juggle these things. So he, at the age of 19, 20, 21, I had these heroes talk to me more about business and manhood and fatherhood and mm -hmm. life than fame. So it, it, I'm very blessed, very blessed, because most people would never have the opportunity to learn that from their hero. They just ask, oh, Mike, you're, you played against the book. Like, this man's telling me about investment. Yeah. And really, like, so I, I know for a fact, man, that I have a responsibility to share that. Because mm. they shared it with me, and they didn't have to. I was an employee. Wasn't their friend, wasn't their, their relative. I was just a random kid that got there, and they decided to to – teach me what I needed to know to then be able to provide for myself. Dude, those two lessons. And the thing with trying, you're doing. Whenever you're trying, you're actually doing it. Like, mm -hmm. like let's remember that. But that other thing, right? In, in this world where we want to be everywhere, we want to be seen, we want to be in it, FOMO, 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 <sighs> that is a nugget. Yeah, bro. That's why like, I, don't, I, I don't feel bad about not showing up. I don't even lie anymore. I don't I, like when you're younger, you're like, oh, I'm on my way. I mean, nope, I'm not doing it, bro. I don't feel like it. No disrespect to you. I just, I just want to be at the cribs. I want to chill. I agree. Cause yeah. even now we used to show up to every birthday, wherever it's at the birthday, the birth, no disrespect. I love everyone. And I'd be like, yo, I'm not going. Let's do lunch one-on-one. -on -one. Let me treat you on your day for your moment. That's Take it. me up on that. Usually it doesn't happen, but like, I'm not going to be the scene. I'm not going to be part of the the hoopla and I'm not dropping 300. Let me give you the 300. Do you have a credit card payment to do? I'd rather give you that. Uh, straight up. Because we show up because we worry so much about what other people think about us mm -hmm. versus what do we need? Like, I'm a big fan of saying, nope. Like, I do not care because my mental health and inner peace is way more important than someone being temporarily offended by me saying no. And if they really know me, they understand like, okay, Jason has been through PTSD, anxiety, he's seen his friend get shot. It's for me to have, for him to show up, mm -hmm. it takes a lot more mental preparation because he's, he has to be, you know, and I explained to my friends, like if you ever, if I don't show up somewhere, it's probably because I need a mental health day. Like I need to just make sure I'm okay. Because yeah. if I'm in your space and my energy's off, and I don't know someone, that just attracts the wrong type of interaction. And they may not understand that being neurodivergent, you have extreme highs and extreme lows. I don't feel like explaining that every time mm -hmm. I go out. Like, yeah, I'm here, but I'm quiet because today is a low day for me because autism is whooping my ass and I feel anxious. Yeah, I usually bring my wife with me. She's my wing person and she'll notice it and be like, all right, babe, let's get out of here. Mm -hmm. So it's a smoother mm -hmm. exit. But at this age of 42, bro, I just tell my friends, like, hey, I'm not, I'm not okay today. And let's catch up next week. Let's build. Mm -hmm. I'll be better because mm -hmm. I want to be my best self when yeah. I when I'm with you. But right there, that's respect. Because even I know I have my look. I swing up and down too. And there's times, there's times because we record the pod twice a month. There's times where like mm, I can't have a bad day on a, on a day where I've got to hold space and and be curious and be present. But then it's got. I can't beat myself up if I do. Maybe maybe one day that'll be the day, and I'll just preface it, yo. This is where I'm at right now. We could still do work, though. Let's figure it out. I think that's what we have to do, man, to show these people, like, you can work through your pain. You can still smile through your pain. You don't have to be all consumed by it. You have a choice. Like, if I was to explain half the stuff that happened to me prior to me coming here, and you listening to this at home, and someone seeing my energy, not knowing anything that I dealt with today, they wouldn't realize like I'm carrying a lot, mm -hmm. but I don't allow that to stop me from serving because we got to show people that we are all works in progress. We can't keep showing the finished work. We yeah. got to show the end progress, the messiness. That's the social media is the finished work though, right? It's the finished work. 
how do we keep start going raw? Let's go more raw. Let's get in there. Let's get the BTS. Like I paint love around the world. People must think I'm just the happiest clam yeah, around. Yeah. Like, woo, he's so loving. No, dude. There's days like, uh uh-uh, uh, I'm gonna lay on that couch right there, and I'm just like, mm mm. Ain't it? I mean, you put it into the world because you need to see it. And I yeah. exactly. That's what I don't think people realize about artists. Most of the time, the conversation we having is with ourselves, and they just happen to bear witness to it. Like the greatest example of that is John Coltrane's A Love Supreme. Like I only listen to two things when I create, Illmatic um, and A Love Supreme, because both of them sonically and just, it's just perfect, at least for me in my humble opinion. But in the liner notes of A Love Supreme, you know, John Coltrane said that he was creating this album for an audience of one. This was a thank you letter to God to say, yo, you saved me from heroin addiction, from bad business partners, from just a tough situation mm-hmm. in my life. Like I'm doing this album for you and you alone. And I'm going to put my best effort into thanking you through this work. And we just are fortunate enough to be able to listen to his thank you letter to who he prayed to, to who he believed mm-hmm. in. And that's how I look at my work. Like, I'm not doing this for any other audience but an audience of one. And I'm trying to say thank you through my effort for being able to be in a position I'm in. And if it helps people, that's beautiful. But this is just my whole life is a love letter to God to say thank you. Mm. Most of us are mirrors of each other. Like, I paint because I need to, and I'm a mirror, and I never expected it to land one way for someone else. And you start realizing they take the work yeah, and take it to their interpretation, and I'm like, yeah, that's why. But here was my reason, but that's my reason too. Go for it. That's your reason with the work. Man, I'm telling you, bro, like that album, when you listen to it and you just sit and listen to how he made the saxophone like sing. It's like you, it's, you, I imagine the person on their knees with their hands up in reverence to God, just crying out. Because he, he did something with that saxophone, played notes that had never been played in a sequence that, like, it was crazy. He created a whole new way of painting through music. You know what I mean? Um, so I think any creative that wants to study a, ma- a modern masterpiece and wants to dissect it, you know, I would say, look at a love supreme by John Coltrane and understand what he was going through when he made that. Mm-hmm. Like, it was... It's crazy. Yeah, I'm going to definitely look into that. Now, a little bit earlier, you, you, you kind of brought up your friend getting shot in front of you. And some of the stuff I looked at, because you were re- reminiscent, reflecting, you're like, from almost being killed, from almost dying from sickness, from potentially being killed, to being in front of Michael Jordan, to designing something that got you from intern to working there as a contractor, mm-hmm. And then that's continued moving you forward, forward, and forward. So how do we control our destiny? And can we build the life of our dreams, you know, by honing in that creative craft? And how do we start doing that? Looking at everything Mm. that led us down to where we are today. You know, the thing about destiny is, is once again, it's preordained, right? Mm. Like you... Like fate? uh, Yeah, fate. I would say divine provocation. Mm. You know, there are things that are happening without our consent and it's just in front of us. Like, like I believe anything that I have as a vision is essentially, that's a destination, that's a timestamp. And I, I don't know how I get to that vision that I have in my mind, but I know that that's the direction I'm heading in mm-hmm. and all my decisions will help me get there. So I've abandoned trying to control the destiny because that's like being a quarterback and a receiver of your blessings. Yeah. It's like throwing a ball, trying to run a route. Like at a certain point, you just got to run your route and get open and be ready to look over your inside shoulder mm-hmm. to catch it. Or if you got to go to the post, you just get catch and keep your two feet in bounds, right? Mm-hmm. That's how it is with blessings. We try to control when we receive it, how we receive it. And whether or not you're a person of faith or you're just a person who believes in the universe or divine law or whatever, the thing is, is all you could do is be prepared for when the opportunity is presented to you, mm. but you cannot control when the opportunity happens. Yeah. I tell my kids, like, I can plant all these seeds, but I can't control the rain. I just got to keep planting because yeah. one day it's going to rain and I will have a harvest. It may not look like it now. It may be a drought, but I'm getting out there every day and I'm cultivating and I'm planting seeds. And a lot of us are impatient and we want to quickly harvest. Yeah, And it's like nothing in nature because we're organic beings in ecology. We're not humans in an economy. And I think that distinction allows us to slow down because anything in nature that is precious and valuable takes time. Anything that isn't, 
it's instantaneous and it's thrown away. Mm -hmm. So I don't want I don't want microwave blessings, man. I want like Michelin star blessings. I want I want <laughs> I want yeah. them to take their time, prepare the right thing for me, because not everything that is given to you is right for you. So for me, I try to operate within the boundaries of my purpose. And when I deviate from that is when I feel dissatisfied, overwhelmed, overworked. And I feel like my purpose is to give people a glimpse of beauty in this reality. Because most mm. people think that when I die, I'll be okay or I'll feel at peace. It's like, if I could show you a little bit of that in this world through my work, yeah. then man, maybe you, you, you'll want to stay here another day. You want to keep trying. Mm. So that, that's, that's what I focus on is, is not the destiny, but the inputs. You know, what can I do? What can I keep doing? Um, and in doing, I'm becoming. Whatever that thing is I'm becoming, I don't know. Yeah. But at least I can control, you know, that part of it, the initiation, you know. And then once you become it, you can have it. Yep, then you can share it. Yeah. No, so it's, there's, there's a surrender, right? There's, there's a moment there where, like, let's surrender to certain things. Because as athletes and creatives and everything are like, I am the master of my destiny. And that, that's where that question really comes from. It's like we can't control everything. There's very little in the world we can control, but what can we, we can control surrendering to the thought of something That's it. and then putting in the work to get to that point to receive that opportunity or that blessing. That's it, bro. That's it. Like people don't realize how strong you have to be to exercise restraint. Like that's the wild part. We look at the person who yells and screams, oh, they're so aggressive and mm -hmm. they, no, they're not. They're out of control, lack discipline and are easily disrupted. Mm-hmm. As a person who grew up doing competitive, you know, combat sports and being trained by a military dad, the strongest people exercise the greatest amount of restraint. And that's because they're battling themselves. And when you endeavor to battle yourself, man, that's the hardest fight because you know all your weaknesses. Your opponents don't. They don't know anything about your weaknesses. You yeah. do. And so I think that surrender, if we start to really celebrate, you know, the people who who say no, the people who apologize, the people who lead with unconditional love, then we start to show the strength in restraint because mm. people think it's weakness. And I tell folks, like, listen, man, if I believe in unconditional love, that gives a person the right to offend me. <laughs> like, mm. the, people have the right to offend me because I believe in unconditional love. I have to forgive you and let that go because I don't know the context by which you were brought up, what you're going through, and how you're expressing yourself may not even be intended for me. It may not even be about me. Most times it ain't. Yeah. But we take it personal because we don't have that self-discipline and self-governance. And so I really do believe in it, man. Like restraint is the thing that's going to save this generation. Um, self-discipline is going to save this generation. Delayed gratification. Bro, I'm telling you. Man, that's one of the core signs of successful people. It's like they did a study where they gave kids some a snack. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, and the kids, yeah. the kid who didn't eat it, they correlated that to people who will save money and have a healthier lifestyle. And then a kid who just gobbled everything up, the Halloween candy, they're like, those are the people who crash and burn because yeah. then it's no appreciation there. Yeah. It's instant satisfaction. Um, so yeah, I'm the delayed gratification guy. Like slow money's for show money. Oh know? yeah. No, I'm on that train too. Yeah. I'm all about the long play, the long term, really seeing it through. There's certain things where like, ah, I want to post that I'm busy, that I'm yeah. doing this right now. I can't wait to share this. I'm like, no, yeah. I got to wait. I got to wait. wait. So when I create something, I really hate waiting. That delayed gravity. Yeah, but, yeah. but creating it, that whole process, I love holding it back. And like now it's ready for the world. And I think there's a, there's a, a balance of pure excitement, that childlike, like, I just want to show you. Oh, and then like, let me be smart. It's going to be out there when it needs to be out there, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I suck at um, delayed gratification when it comes to gift giving. Oh, yeah. Like, I suck, bro. It's like Christmas like, round. I got come. you this. Yeah, like, oh, babe, are you going to be hype? You going to like, babe, my anniversary is in a month. Oh, shit, you're right. Uh, love it and pretend to love it again when you see it in the month. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'll get you something else. Yeah, yeah. Because it's like, man, I, I don't want to withhold with yeah. joy from people, you know? Um, so that's the only time where I'm like hella impatient is when I want to serve or give someone mm -hmm. something. I'm like, this is for you. This is for you. Because mm -hmm. in my spirit, I've always thankfully listened to that urge. You know, when you feel the urge to call somebody or reach out, I act on that. So I always text a friend like, can I pray for you? Are you okay? And more often than not, in my journey, a lot of the people that I reached out to have told me like, bro, when you hit me, I was thinking about killing myself. I was going through mm -hmm. something. I don't know yeah. what it was. How did you know? It's like, I don't, I don't ignore that urge 
to give, to serve, to say, hey, bro, I love you. I'm proud of you. A lot of people are uncomfortable with it because they're like, what do you want? I'm like, nothing. I just really want you to be okay because somebody needs you to be okay. Yeah. Because I'm trying to be the person that, that, like I said, I'm trying to be a person that people say don't exist. Like, I want to be part of that lineage of highly creative, highly empathic, deeply connected to the youth creatives. Like, you look at Jim Henson's of the world. Mm -hmm. You look at Mr. Rogers, mm -hmm. LeVar Burton. We don't have that. I want to be that. Like, yeah. I want to be, I don't mind being a role model for kids. I want that responsibility. I don't get why people want to be leaders with no accountability. Yeah. How can we be a leader of culture but not actually care about the kid and how they look at you when you act the way you act? Mm -hmm. That's a boss. A boss has no accountability. They just have a title. Yeah. So for me, man, I care deeply about, about that, how I make people feel. And I pretend like I have a four-year-old with me at all times when I talk because I'm thinking that four-year-old is listening to me and I got to be careful what I say or how I behave because that four-year-old is looking up to me. And that gives me this morality check all the time. Mm. You know, if like this little kid is staring at me and there's times where it really is a four-year-old kid looking at me like, you work with athletes and draw pictures? And I'm thinking if I had a bad experience with this child and said something to them or mean, that four-year-old becomes a 25-year-old mm. with a chip on their shoulder that's going to tell me that I disrespected them when they come and see me at some event. I don't want that memory, bro. I don't yeah. want that to happen. Like, no, it's, we don't think that again that goes on that long play right that's a long game that's really looking at that but this is a good segue because i, I want to go into the you know our youth is our future and we forget yeah. we, you know as designers creators people that sell products sometimes we're like we're trying to sell it to the person buying it and that's yeah. already the adult and hopefully we can make an impact but it's harder to rewire an adult than, than a youngin, yeah. right? My kid's two and a half. Like, I'm doing, I'm being so much softer and better in yeah. this be, when he's around me, even less reactions. You know, I was joking around, like, yeah, he hits me perfect, boom, right in the junk. <laughs> bah! What do you want to react when you get kicked in the, you want to, like, ah, fuck, ah. But he did, I'm not going to react like that because he's going to get scared. All he, he doesn't know what he did. Nope. But he's going to get scared, take that in. Oh, dad just like, erupted yeah that he was a scary monster yeah so instead i'm just like oh, buddy let's be careful like yeah. come give me a hug and i try to i try to get his hug and love to kind of pass the pain through yeah, yeah. but i'm noticing that like if we can i'm getting better because trying to do that with adults it's a little different but you've got this whole creative design process a kid's book about design and I think design is a misconception, right? You just because you're a designer doesn't mean you know how to draw. Nope. You know, just because you're a designer it doesn't mean you know how to make a poster. Yep. Just that's what people don't realize. Like even me is like, Ruben, you're an artist. Just make the flyer for the event. So like, what is design? And how do we have those conversations with our kids? Because they're they're constantly creative, especially yeah. for the quote unquote non creatives, non designers, not. Yeah. Yeah. So. The thing that's funny about the word design is it's been weaponized mm -hmm. because it's also now considered an asset class. And anytime something is given an, an extrinsic value and it's given market value, then it has to be a highly controlled industry. And so they've bifurcated design is what you do when you have the proper pedigree and you go to the right schools. And in some cases you had a right accent, most likely British. And they're like, oh, you're a designer. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have that accent, don't go to the right school. That's a nice kid, very creative. So you see how just the, the simplification of creativity being like, oh, that's so great. Look at you, you're an amateur. Yeah. And design being, you have to have this beautiful accent and speak eloquently and da 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 da. It doesn't allow us to see ourselves in this industry. I saw it directly correlated to the cost of art schools. I got to art school in 1998. It was really affordable. And this is an elite art school in the Midwest, like one of the top at that time, the top in the, in the country and like highly competitive, average age 25, still reasonably priced. By the time I graduated, it was like a 400% increase Damn. in tuition because there yeah. was too many kids from diverse backgrounds that were running towards creativity because we came out of the 90s where we saw Sean John and Rock mm -hmm. Aware and Dev, like we saw entrepreneurship and creativity at the highest level in the Cross 90s. Cross colors, Cross, all that, yeah. We saw, we were like, oh, they could do that too. Mm -hmm. They sold it out of that trunk, I could. So the moment design became a vehicle for generational wealth creation, for eco economic you know, opportunities being kept within the community, circulating the dollar longer amongst people who were disenfranchised, then design was pulled out, put into auction houses, 
put up as some pedestal item that you can't touch unless you're validated or you're an elite person. But all of us are born with the ability to create. And it's a phrase called creatio ex nihilo, which means create from nothing. And it, the Latin, in, in ancient times, they said that phrase as it related to God or whatever you want to call him. It's like this notion of nothing existed, then it's created. Same thing with imagination. Like, I mean, it's in my mind, but until I put it on paper, it's not a real thing. So design for me is not the act of creativity. It's the questions we ask. Mm. Designers ask the best questions. And if you ask the right question, you can get an answer that helps the most amount of people. That's the goal. Once we're told that design is about solutions, then we go into skills, drawing, 3D modeling. But skills are determined by what the market places on, like the value the market places on a skill. Um, so that's always, that always changes. But your mindset and your process, that's what you get paid for as a creative. So most of the times in my journey, I tell people, one, um, I was a designer that has graduated to being a creative. I can go into any industry and ask a series of questions and figure out where's the opportunity for me to deploy my gifts. Mm -hmm. And I can always find ways to then bring other people into that conversation. And that's just through the questions I ask. So if a person's listening to this and they say they want to be a designer, I would say, how good are you at asking questions? Mm. Like really practice that, practice inquisitiveness, because all of us inherently have bias. And most of us aren't good at not jumping to the end, to the solution and then trying to justify the solution throughout yeah. the process. So staying emotionally neutral and objective for as long as possible, that's the role of a designer. Because the stuff I do, man, I, I work on things for people that are totally different than me that I may never meet but I still have to give them my best because that person is hoping that whatever product or experience I put on, is gonna help them feel or look or think the way they wanna feel, think or look. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the questions we should be asking? So I would say the first core question is, is this needed? Is this needed? Is this a, the problem I should be solving? Is this the biggest problem I should solve? Who is it a problem for? Why is it a problem? Do I contribute to the problem? Have I experienced this problem? Is there anything about the problem that scares me, which will require me not to dig in deep? Like we just, we first start in my process, I question my bias. Mm. Like I'll get a project or a brief and they'll say, we're working on, you know, autonomous driving vehicle or 3D printing homes. And we want to work with you to help figure out how to deploy this new technology. My first reaction is, all right, I'm looking at the person on this call or I'm meeting with them. I'm subconsciously judging them. Let me first check that because anything that comes out of their mouth, I'm going to be filtering it through this critique of because all of us prejudge people. Yeah. And we got to be clear. There's a difference between racism, prejudice and discrimination. Mm -hmm. All of us are prejudiced. That's a part of self-preservation as yeah. humans. We have to assess. Is it a risk or is it a you know, is it a, is it a friend? Like that's just how we are as people. So once I address my own prejudice of like, wait, OK, I'm not fully listening to this person because I've already assumed I know what they're going to say. Mm -hmm. I stopped doing that. Then I start asking questions like, huh, how have you proven that this is a problem? How many people is it a problem for? Why is it a problem? What motivates you to tackle this problem? How long do you think this should be a problem? And you'd be surprised after like five questions, you get to like the root cause. And in, 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 um, in triaging like failure in manufacturing, Toyota created this thing called the five whys. And it's it's a operational principle of when you have a problem in manufacturing and you ask five whys and you get to the root cause of the problem. Mm. I've applied that with a hybrid of like forensic crime scene analysis to studying people and how they move throughout the world. And then that those two things are what I use to create. Okay. Real nerdy process, but it's fun. It's simple actually. Yeah. I think it's simple. And I, and, and you know, I'm sitting here, so why do I need it? Because I believe there needs to be more love in the world. So I'm solving that problem. And yeah. I already know. And I'm so fiercely dedicated to it. Then I'm like, I don't see a place where love doesn't apply. Yeah, yeah. So like, I'm just constantly, does it have to be a shoe or a tequila or this or that? No, but those are things already in the world. Let's just add the message to it. So That's I'm it. just starting to kind of. But what I'm liking from this conversation, what I keep learning from you is I, I'm not that. I didn't learn all that. I went to school to be a doctor. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to be an orthopedic surgeon. Like, yeah. There's a different kind of brain in here, yeah. but I've very much always been a creative. But that design language is different. Or also in the art world, they're like, what art school would you get? I'm like, I don't have any of that. So I'm not anointed or I'm not in the space. Yeah. I shouldn't be allowed. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, 
I'm going to make the conversation so loud you have to join me. And it's a long game again. We're playing the long game. But asking these questions, I think, are very important. Yeah, bro, because it's like, at what point was it wrong for us to stop putting our drawings on a refrigerator? Like, at what point were we told, mm, now you got to leave that to the pros? Like, you got to leave it to this dude who has a graphic design degree or this woman who has an illustration degree. We were kids. We all put our stuff up on a fridge if we were fortunate enough to have a fridge. Mm -hmm. Let me just preface it with saying that. Some people did not, they grew up in living in the backseat of a car or in, in an environment where they had no electricity. Uh, but there was this moment in all of our childhoods where there was an adult that wanted to see what we did, that wanted to validate our effort. We started to tell ourselves that we no longer can do that. And so you're every much of an artist just as much as I am. Mm -hmm. The paths to get there, totally different, but we're both in the same world doing the same things for different reasons. Yeah. And I think once we start doing that, acknowledging that there's no, there's no amount of accreditation that you need to be creative. That's just to be accepted into a world that wants to control your value. Because mm -hmm. they want to tell you how much you're worth. They want to tell you how much your work is worth, how much impact you can have. They want to control it because it's an asset. Yeah. But I'm like, once again, the long game. I'm doing this for the audience of one. I genuinely don't care about resale value of my product because mm -hmm. I'm building it for the kid who saved their money up for a year to buy one pair of my shoes, and they're yeah. going to wear it until it's a hole in those shoes. Like I care about that kid, not the kid buying 100 pairs, flexing on Instagram just to flip it on, on, mm -hmm. on, a, on a secondary market. Like. I care about the kid who's like, man, I'm wearing hand-me-down clothes. The only new item I get for back to school is some shoes, and I'm saving up my money because I want those products. Mm -hmm. I was that kid, so I care deeply about that, that, that type of mindset. Yeah, and that's what I resonate with, right? And I know the proof's in the pudding, right? You did these Yeezy One Protos, and I think yeah. one was just an eye. You're like, yeah, I don't even want to know what it went for. I don't even want to track it down because I did it for the kid. You know, I want to do all these things because yeah. I want to change the way people operate and view the world. Yeah, yeah. And if they sell for a bunch of money and sell out, cool. And, and honestly, it's not going to affect my pocket. Yeah, yeah. But if any of the hype makes more kids want to choose love, like yeah. that's what I'm talking about. How do we rewire this conversation? Yeah. Now, and as a creative, my other quote, you brought something up earlier, it's, it's skills. Right. Being a creative, you have it, you own it. Everyone's a creative. We all have different levels of it. You call it talent, talentless and everything in between, but skills. And sometimes it's like, Hey, I don't have the skills to 3d model. I mm. didn't go to school for that. Yeah. And I'm trying to research this. And this is just a general question. And you go and research and they're like, yeah, I need $20,000 to do that. I'm like, dude, I just have the idea. I haven't even made money and I need to pay you that before I could even make my creation real. Yeah. Like, how do we start affording those types of things? Yeah. And where does that, you know, like, and I, kids probably get their dreams crushed all the time with that. Because I know I get my dream yeah. dreams crushed and I'm a grown man looking for these things. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's tough because a lot of times where, where designers and creatives get to is a point of like proactively going on the offense to say, this is what you're paying me. Because we get lowballed all the time. Oh, yeah, I know. Right? And so people just think, oh, I could just press a button and you do it. It's like, nah, dog. I could press a button because it's taken me 42 years of my life to do it in a day. Mm -hmm. You pay somebody else, it's going to take them six months. Like, I could do this in a week. Doesn't mean that it's lesser value. So I think why it's becoming so much tension in the creative field is because the organizations or the people within companies who, who control the budget don't understand the real value of creativity. And not creativity is like an initiative, but creativity is vital to how the business will operate, like a mm -hmm. core operating principle. It should be just as much as regarded as highly as sustainability, it should be creativity. Those should be embedded in every business and the creative teams need, need to give the right resources and the right insight to help make the enterprise more valuable. And what happens now is people don't realize when you look at, any company, any society, the first thing to get cut is the arts. Mm -hmm. And then they wonder why we regress. That's like taking nutrition away from an athlete. Mm -hmm. Like a creative without inspiration is literally like an athlete without proper nutrients. Over time, like they might perform out the gate. But over time, yeah, man, your bone density, your muscle fibers, that stuff is going to be messed up if you're not getting proper replenishment. Yeah. So the more creative is, is told no or devalued, the more you start to either have this spirit of like offense, like I'm gonna go, I, 
I'm going to charge everybody through the roof and I don't care. Nobody's going to take nothing from me. Or the opposite is I'm walking away. So it's like really two extremes in the industry now. People are like, I'm just going to mm -hmm. go over here and just make dumb money doing day trading because creativity, it's not for me. Mm -hmm. Or I'm just going to be an a-hole, treat everybody terribly because I've been screwed over. I think there's a third path where barter system. Win-win, man. Win-win. Like, I don't need to know everything. I just need to know the right people who know the thing I don't know and create mutual value. Like, I'm good at this. You're good at that. But that takes self-assessment, though. You have to be willing to say, hey, I need help. I'll, this is what I can do. Mm -hmm. um, we're getting to that now. I think we're getting to back to the barter system where, all right, you don't know 3D? Cool. I know this guy. He can help you. But you do know this. You guys help each other. Mm-hmm. Um, there's free platforms too. The tools are becoming more open source. So like Blender, you can learn Blender, which is a highly, highly, highly impactful tool for free. It's like $9 a month. You mm -hmm. go on and take your classes in 3D model. There's generative AI and machine learning that to me, I've been playing with that tech for about 11 years when it was predictive analytics. So like deep, deep, deep data analysis. Mm -hmm. Now it's generative. So as a creative, I'm like, this is a superpower. This is not going to remove me at all because the technology is only as good as what you tell it to do mm -hmm. it won't ever supersede like free will of a human being yeah that's our superpower it's free will um no there's no algorithm that can predict with 100 percent certainty what we ever would really do mm -hmm. might be close but free will is a beautiful thing so yeah there's always a way man i just i don't make excuses i make decisions like if, if I want something bad enough, I will figure it out. Yeah, I mean, I'm on that, and I love the barter system, and I'm not afraid of AI, because in the end of the day, I say, wait a minute, I need to learn how to use AI. I need to learn how to share my creativity it. with it. If anything, I think it'll take away from the, the skilled people that yeah. learn. It's yeah. not going to take away from the creative or the artist or anything like that. No, no, no. And even the skilled people, like the ones who just 3D model, if you... If you know the language, the technical language, it just makes your use of generative AI even better. Then you use it too, exactly. So like if I go in and I'm using mid-journey, I'll put in volumetric lighting, this aspect ratio, this lens, this thing, this, that, da -da 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 -da, all these technical terms. And my result is like super close to what I want to see. Because I, I, I think for me, if we can cut the fat of our process, which is ideation, then we can just focus on refinement. Because mm -hmm. good design, just like with surgery, it's deduction. It's like, what, what is it? Let me chip away, chip away, chip away. Oh, that's the thing we're going to mm -hmm. go in and fix? It's not additive. And people think design is just slapping stuff on It's not. It's reductive. It's deductive. So, yeah, man, um, a lot of what you were doing, like you say, you went to school to study, that was art. Like, all artists learn human anatomy first. That's mm -hmm. the hardest thing to work on as a human body. Yeah. And you found art. At the, in a different way, but you've always been an artist. Mm -hmm. Just the world didn't give you the language for it because the mm -hmm. world didn't give me the language until I heard the phrase industrial designer. I thought I was going to be an engineer. Yeah, like I was teaching myself mechanical electrical engineering in high school, making gadgets and walkie-talkies and stuff. Heard about ID, and I'm like, yo, that's it. That's I want to do that. So a lot of it, we have the talent. We just may not have the lexicon and the language. Mm. And that's how they hide, they hide everything with words, man. Mm -hmm. So that's why I tell people, AI is for us. Blockchain technology is for us. Don't focus on NFTs and crypto. That's the scary part. Focus on the tech because they will make you look over here, gobble up all the market value here. And in 20 years from now, we're getting in with what's left. So no, we need to be in the front of the creation of these tools. Yeah. And... Uh one point here to keep it quick. It's just an observation. I want to know if you realize it or your thoughts around it. We start seeing all these people, artists, being anointed yeah. creative directors. Uh, yeah. And like, there's, you see, like, <laughs> on and even on social media, like, how is that now the creative director? Like, yeah. Daniel Sharm with the Cavs or yeah. Pharrell here or there. Or like, yeah. and I'm sitting here like, dude, I could be a creative director somewhere because they have the employees to do the other thing. It's the people that start using the vision or the culture of what they're starting to understand. What yeah. is your kind of take on that? And Yeah, I think just like the word innovation has been watered down to mean everything and nothing, I think the title creative director has been watered down because remove creative, right? Directing. Directing requires process, efficiencies, feedback loops, accountability, hitting things on time, deadlines, managing budgets which is completely the opposite 
of what a lot of these people do in their process. They're very like, I'll do it when it's done. It'll come out when it's ready. Mm -hmm. It'll, but when you modify the phrase creative with director, you're now beholden to the enterprise mm -hmm. that you're working for. And they have quarterly numbers they need to hit. They have annual board meetings they need to be ready for. They have stockholders and shareholders and stakeholders that they need to appease. And so the fluidity of the creative process juxtapose the rigor of a corporation is always going to have tension. So when we give this title to a person who sits outside of the structure, who has the ability to take their time because they're independently wealthy, have success, what you're now doing is you're, you're, you're confusing the kid as to like, well, what is actually the meaning of this role? Because mm -hmm. it's being placed everywhere. Just like the kids now, they'll come in and say, I got an innovative solution. I'm like, okay, stop. What is the problem you're solving? How's this innovative? Like, describe me what you mean. Because anybody that says I'm focused on innovation, I'm like, what do you mean by that? Mm -hmm. Is it near term, long term? Is it revolutionary, evolutionary? Is it incremental? Is it exponential? What type of innovation? So I think we're going to start to see more nuance with language in terms of how we describe titles for creatives. Because I tell people, for me, I'm an intersectional designer. That's a new term. And I'm putting it into the world because I pull data points from so many different things because of, of how my brain works. I can find intersections that aren't obvious to other people. Mm. A lot of the stuff that corporations are doing, and this isn't a bad thing. I think it's great. You see Daniel Arsham, you know, he actually is a prolific architect. Like that man understands project management better than most project managers. Like he's solid. Pharrell has done it with keeping schedules with music. I'm glad they're in those positions. But to the kid who isn't looking at design as a second career thing, right? Yeah. It's their primary thing. Keep doing you. Don't be distracted. Because a lot of the companies are trying to find a shortcut to relevancy. And they do a deal because they think, oh, I can get this name that gives me this audience that makes us look credible. And that works for a time. But that time is coming to an end in a lot of industries yeah. because it's too risky to place your value on one person. And companies are going to start to invest more in communities instead of just people who mm -hmm. are influential in the singular voice. Because we've seen how that's turned out negatively for some companies. Yeah. Um, so I would just tell that kid, man, don't be discouraged. Be encouraged because it's going to drive up the value, you know, that you'll be able to get at the table. It also expands your horizons because just as much as they can come into our world, you should start going into theirs. Um, that's what I do. Like, man, musicians and athletes want to be designers. Great. Then I will go and drop an album or I'll go set up a gym. Like there's no barrier to our interest. Yeah. And that's the beautiful part. Well said on that trying to remain relevant. You know, they're not, they're not actually trying to steer the ship. They're trying to steal culture. That's it. It's and, a shortcut. And let, let, let's segue into that now. Like, we're all not everyone's trying to create culture. I mm. really am. Like, I went to like this is live through love. I used to say the collab with Nike is gonna be Nike's gonna say just do it like Ruben and live through love. Yeah, yeah. Like I say it all the time. Like that's the thing. Yeah. But this year I added another phrase, which is creating a culture of love. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's what. We're trying to do here. You're creating a culture. A lot of us are creating culture. What can we do to really like start pivoting and creating this culture when we see, because you're thinking the same thing, empathy, compassion, this, love, you know, all the antithesis of kind of what's actually happening yeah. out there, but you still see hype and quick drops and, you know, that, that life yeah. still like in this limit. How are we going to be able to flip that? Yeah, I mean... It's ebbs and flows, right? Like, and I think you understand this with your, you know, your financial background. When people are investing in stock, there's an index uh, that goes between on the right tail greed and the left tail altruism. We're at the far right of that index now. Like, we're in the height of greed. Mm -hmm. So greed and hype and vanity all go hand in hand. But the but it but the pendulum swings the opposite direction. Nothing is permanent. And so right now, yes, being a narcissist is the desirable thing. Like it's been rewarded, it's been celebrated in pop culture, mm -hmm. the self-aggrandization. That's it. That's fine. That's we're now at this stage in what the culture wants to reward because they're like these are provocative, really irreverent spirits, and they just get attention. It's attention at all costs. It's an attention-based economy. So I need to keep the eyes on us. We got to figure out what figures are polarizing, um, or what figures are highly influential, talented. So that's the game we're playing now. I tell people my jobs be faster in the future. I'm not worried about what's happening now. 
if y'all zigging, I'm zagging. Mm -hmm. If being a narcissist is the wave, I'm going to be the kindest on the planet because by the time the whole world is narcissist, it's people like us who are kind and giving yeah. that are starting to become the rare commodity. And they're like, wait, we need to work with this person because mm. everybody's like this. This guy's standing out. So don't, don't get caught up. I tell a lot of the young creatives, don't get caught up in what's happening now. Ask yourself, where does this head? Because in five years, 10 years, 15 years, the truth of the matter is, one, no culture is monolithic, right? There's no such thing as, like, there's no wrong way to be black. There's no wrong way to be Latino. There's no wrong way to be white. Like, it's so nuanced now. Mm -hmm. You can't just say, I'm part of black culture. What does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> black nerd culture? Black conservative culture? Yeah. Farmer? Like, what part of it? Because it isn't just one monolithic thing. The second piece is the numbers don't lie. 2040, the world is going to be predominantly full of people who are mixed. And at that point, when everybody's mixed and from different cultures, blending and trading, it's going to be about shared common interests, mm -hmm. not shared characteristics. So it's going to be a lot harder for companies to pick one person that represents their interests because it's yep. going to be nuanced. So you, once again, the community. So I'll just say play the long game. Whatever's popular now will not be popular in three to five years. Plan for that moment. You know, and it's harder because you're, you're enticed to want to play the game the way you see people winning today. But every game has an end date. Every game has an expiration. Every game runs out of time on the clock. It's just the nature of sport. That's mm -hmm. why I said creativity is a sport. Mm -hmm. The game we're playing now, remember, in the early 2000s, basketball changed because we saw A and one. Mm -hmm. Iverson came in a game that became a you know, jump shooting ball handler you know, league. LeBron comes in, big man come in, that became big man with footwork league. Yeah. The game evolves. So I think as a creative, don't focus on your position in the culture, focus on your style of contribution. Mm. The style is what's gonna keep you relevant. Yeah. Your position in culture won't. Stay focused on what you're doing, the vision, the purpose. That's it, dog. And you become it. Yes. Instead of chasing it. Yep, yep. Like Gavin from Supervision, I always say protect the vision. That's really it. The vision entrusted to you. Protect it. Believe yeah. in it. Nurture it. Your time is coming. Amazing. Thank you so much. Wrapping this up with the yeah. final question. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, Jason. Yeah. <laughs> you got serious. Okay. Oh, it's yeah. the Oprah moment. It's Let's the go. one. It's the one. We take a beat. <laughs> Pregnant pause. Shh. <laughs> Don't worry. There's no wrong answer. Mm -hmm. There's your answer. Jason, how do you define living a life through love? Oh, man. Um, I define living a life through love. Obviously, I, I, I'm, I'm going to relate it back to scripture. And when it talks about love is patient, love is kind, love doesn't keep a record of wrongdoing. Like, that's living a life of love. Like I said, for me, unconditional love requires me to let go and forgive a lot. The, the way that we're mostly oppressed is through anchoring ourselves or tethering ourselves to the spirit of offense. Mm -hmm. And once you allow the world to offend you, now you get to walk around with this justification for your anger and your rage. And everything is just like, well, yeah, of course, you know, dude, I'm, and that just robs you of your ability to, you know, contribute to the tapestry of humanity. Mm. And to me, I, I want to, I want to be intricately woven into, into history. I don't, I don't want to be a generational talent. I want to be a historical figure. So it requires me to like let go of a lot of things and forgive people a lot of times because I know like hurting people hurt people, mm -hmm. hurting leaders hurt organizations. Every situation I've had in my life wasn't about me because I can honestly say I'm the person I claim to be in those moments and I've done my best effort. But if a person is still transgressing against me, then that says more about them than me and I have to forgive them. So living a life of love is a life of forgiveness because mm. we just all trying to survive, man. That's it. It's true. <laughs> That's it. That's we true. all trying to survive. And it's a matter of our context. Um, and whatever it is we're overcoming, whatever it is we're dealing with, it's not my place to judge you, be angry at you, or to assume that somehow it's about me. So that's it, man. A life of love is a life of forgiveness. Boom. There it is. And, and you brought up a few times, like earlier, you almost basically said, I give you permission to offend me, you know, and I believe you can't be offended. You could take offense. That's it. So you give your power away. So in that position, like I give you permission to offend me, you're actually saying, I'm not going to give you my power. No. 
but it is up to me to take the offense and forgive you if I took offense. That's back on me. So, like, it's personal responsibility. All self-governance, bro. Self-leadership is the thing we're not taught. Mm -hmm. We're taught how to lead people. I'm like, I just want to lead myself. I got enough things I need to deal with. I ain't trying to tell nobody else what to do with their life. Yeah. Um, outside of my kids, they got to listen to me because, you know, I pay their bills. <laughs> <laughs> Facts. <laughs> But no, imagine if we all led ourselves where the world would be. Like, really think about that. Yeah, yeah. Well, the good thing is, in our context, the world is that way for us. You, the team, myself, yeah. like, we're living in the world that we hope to see. Mm -hmm. We don't have to wait to heaven to experience joy. Like, we got it right now. Like, I don't want to wait. I, I want all of what is meant for me now, you yeah. know? Um, and I do that by being that, you know? Yeah. Well said. Thank yeah. you. Of course, where man. can everyone find you? Uh, easiest place, hit me up on Instagram, just J-A-S-O-N-M-A-Y-D-E-N. -E People always spell my name with a Y. I guess they think I'm fancy. It's just Jason, the same way the Greek spelled it, with Jason and the Argonauts. Um, LinkedIn, I do a lot of work on LinkedIn. It's an underutilized platform. I think more of us need to start looking at it because the people on LinkedIn have the budgets and they're looking for talent. They're looking for opportunities to talk with people like us. Um, yeah, hit me up. Let's do it. Thank you. Of course. Peace. Thank you so much for tuning in to Live Through Love. If you love this episode, you'll love this episode.